everyone. Um, my name is Marlene, and I'm going to be talking to you today about Python and creativity. So before I start, let me just go ahead and introduce myself, tell you a bit more about me. Um, I am a developer advocate at Voltron Data, which is a company based out of California. Uh, we do a lot of things with Apache Arrow. One of the co-founders of the company is Wes McKinney, who created Pandas. So it's a really interesting company to work for. Before this, I was actually working at NVIDIA, so I have a software background, and I, I mainly was working on PDF, which is a GPU uh, data frame library, so very interested in, in engineering. Another thing about me is that I'm the vice chair of the ACM Practitioner Board, and the ACM is the Association for Computing Machinery, and that's the organization that uh, gives out the Turing Award every year, so very cool organization. I'm very new <laughs> in, uh, in the board. I actually joined like last year in December, so still figuring out what we do exactly. Um, and then our final thing about me is that I'm the previous vice chair and a director for the board of directors for the Python Software Foundation. And the PSF is the nonprofit organization behind the Python programming language. And hopefully we know what the Python programming language is. Uh, and if you'd like to know more about what the PSF does, which is, you can go ahead and visit python.org. And if you'd like to connect with me, uh, even after this talk to ask questions, I am on Twitter for anyone that is still there. And I'm also on Blue Sky, which is new. Um, and I also have a website, and those are the links there. So let me first off start by talking or explaining to you why I decided that creativity would be a good topic for me to share with you today. So in 2020, our favorite year, the year of 2020, uh, a group of researchers presented a paper at the ACM's technical symposium, and the, and the paper was titled Non-Cognitive Abilities of Exceptional Software Engineers. And so this was a study that got together 36 experts from around the world. They came from 11 different countries. And then they brought these experts together to try and understand which are the skills, uh, the main skills that it takes, the non-technical uh, skills or the non-cognitive skills that it takes to be an exceptional software engineer. And so let's take a look at three of the, the skills that were identified by these experts. The first skill that was identified was the ability to systemically verify assumptions and validate results. So, you know, earlier on today, Samuel Coben from Pydantic spoke, and he talked about how obviously Pydantic is a, a great tool that you can use to verify, uh, to validate your data, and make sure that your data is, is behaving or is the way you expect it to be. And great software engineers actually do this more broadly. So they're a good, so an exceptional software engineer. What you're going to do is you're not just going to use this in type checking, but you're also going to uh, apply this broadly uh, in almost everything that you do. So you're going to be very detail oriented. The second thing is that great software engineers are curious. So they're consistently wondering why things are happening in a certain way and how things actually work. So when I was at NVIDIA, I remember one time we had a speaker come in. He was a lead software engineer at one of the biggest animation uh, companies in the world, and I will actually talk a little bit more about him a bit later. But I remember him saying that whenever he interviews candidates to join his team, he actually, in order to figure out whether they're naturally curious, he actually asked them how a toilet works. So let's do a, a poll in the room. How many of us can you raise your hand that you would get that question for it? Would you know how a toilet works? And to be able like to explain it. <laughs> okay, um, that's a lot of people. I, I wonder if I pull one of you up right now if you can explain it. I do. But um, for me, at least, I didn't know how to answer that question. And I typically, I, he said actually for the people he interviews, typically they don't know how to answer that question. And so um, I think part of being an exceptional uh, engineer is being able to ask uh, or understand how, or ask those questions about how things work, even for really boring, mundane things like a toilet. <laughs> and then the third skill that makes an exceptional engineer is 
being able to approach a problem in a creative way. So almost all of the experts identify creativity, and specifically creativity in approaching problems in software in a specific way, in a creative way. And so today, we're going to be looking at creativity as a tool that we can use to be exceptional software engineers, and we can use to actually solve the problems that we are facing in, in software development. So what exactly is creativity? A few weeks ago, for me, I went to Disney World, and I really love Disney. I love the rides, I love the environment. Of course, I was there just for my nephew and my niece, uh, but I, was, I, I actually also really enjoyed the rides and everything like that. I really liked princesses as well. And so when I was in Disney World, I personally was just super excited. And when you're around the princesses, I felt very creative. I felt like the people around me were creative. And like, you know when you just start kind of floating around like a princess? I'm not sure if anyone can relate to that feeling. <laughs> um, but I, that's how I was feeling. And typically, when I think about creativity, that is the sort of imagery that comes to my mind. I'm thinking about colors, I'm thinking about sparkles, I'm thinking about magic, you know? And so what does that mean for us as, as software engineers? Does this mean, as software developers, the only way that we can be creative is we need a colorful code editor or a colorful terminal. Um, and I know for me, I do try to do that. In, I use VS Code and choose a, a colorful uh, VS Code theme. Um, but, of course, this is not the answer, and if it was, this talk would be five minutes long. So how do we actually define creativity, and how does it apply to us as Piper users? Well, one of the most popular definitions of creativity comes from a study done in 1988 about creativity and innovation. And the study defines creativity as the product of novel and the production, sorry, the production of novel and useful ideas are created by an individual or group of individuals. And now I know we're also living in the age of generative AI and large language models, so I'm not sure if we should put in computers there, but that will be a topic for another day. And even more recently, in 2021, uh, a more recent study focused specifically on what this looks like for software engineers. And it took a more detailed approach to this. So it actually defined seven dimensions of creativity. So let's take a look at each of these dimensions and see how they apply to us today. So the first dimension is creative techniques. And in the study, it pointed out different uh, sort of concrete techniques or practical examples that people use for being creative. And uh, one example of this is maybe mapping solutions. So if you map solutions from one domain to another domain, so say, for example, if you have a solution that you found in Rust or JavaScript, then taking that solution and somehow mapping it to the Python programming language is a form of creativity. The second one is technical knowledge. So uh, one of the ways that the study defined creativity was that creativity is a brew of different inputs. So if you don't have anything to actually put in or put together, uh, it's hard for you to mix things, mix and match things to create new solutions. So you need, as those inputs, some, some technical knowledge. So being able to have a broad understanding of the field so understanding what are the frameworks available to you in the Python uh, space. A third thing is communication. So not only do you need to be technically competent, but to be actually able to communicate your ideas effectively so that in the context of being creative with a group of people, you'll be able to communicate your ideas and you can be collectively more creative. The fourth dimension is constraints. And I think when people think about the word constraints, usually it has a negative connotation to it. But an example of a constraint actually leading to more creativity is performance. So if we're thinking about how do we make our Python code more performant, uh, sometimes that being a constraint in and of itself can help you think, OK, I need to be creative in the way that I write my Python code or the way that I structure it so that it can be more performant. And then the fifth dimension was critical thinking. So you're not just taking solutions and copying and pasting those solutions from Stack Overflow, but you're really thinking about alternatives to those solutions. So if you get a, a solution from Stack Overflow, really analyzing 
for yourself, what are some alternative ways that I can actually implement this solution? Uh, sixth of all <laughs> is curiosity. Like I mentioned before, this is an important skill for us to have. And a big part of curiosity is motivation. So making sure that uh, you have some motivation to actually make you curious. So like I, uh, I, I mentioned earlier about the toilet example, a lot of us don't really have motivation to understand why a toilet works. And maybe if you now know that someone is going to ask you that in an interview, you now have some motivation to be curious about how a toilet works. So, Motivation and curiosity are really tied together as well. And then finally, a creative state of mind is also one of the seven dimensions of creativity. So being able to get into, some people would call it flow state, where you uh, concentrate and you're focused and you can solve a problem creatively. So really thinking as well about your environment, that you're not having lots of distractions uh, during those times. But also as part of a, a creative state of mind, Things like shower thoughts or moments like after I take a nap, sometimes if I have a really hard problem, I'll like sleep. And then when I wake up, I have a good solution to that problem. So all of those are sort of uh, involved in this creative state of mind. So I kind of brushed through all of those, <laughs> um, maybe because we have limited amount of time. But I'd like to actually look at some of these uh, dimensions in more detail. And I'd like to share some examples with you of how I think you can connect to these different dimensions. And so this afternoon, we'll be looking at motivation, techniques, and, and, uh, and technical knowledge. So the first thing, when I talk about motivation, one of the things that I like to share, if I'm ever talking about motivation, is this idea of transcendence. So, Hopefully, I'm not sure if the video is going to play, but let's let's take a look at a video and see. I need to, to click it. Okay. Oh no, I don't think you can hear it. Can you hear that? No, we can't hear. But we can see what's going on there, right? <laughs> We can see this is a soccer, a football game. Uh, we, this is, some people are very excited about their teams winning in soccer, in football. <laughs> and um, yes, so that is, uh, hopefully we got the point there that, of what is happening in this video. So I'm not a really big football fan, but this is a scene that I have observed in many different places. I'm sure it happens here in Lithuania. This is something that happens in Zimbabwe. This is something that happens everywhere around the world. And so my question is, what exactly is going on in this video? Oh, no, the video is playing again. OK. <laughs> so a few years ago, the New York Times published an article titled, Sports Psychology It Isn't Just a Game. And the researchers from this article found that many fans actually become so tied to their teams that they experience hormonal surges and other psychological changes watching the games in just as much in the same capacity that the athletes actually playing in the games do. And one of the uh, researchers that was quoted in this article, James Stapps from Georgia State, he says the results suggest that fans empathize with competitors to such a degree that they mentally project themselves into the game and experience the same hormonal changes that the athletes do. So I love this idea that we as humans can actually transcend space and time and our own physical bodies just by watching someone. We can actually feel inspired to the extent where our body actually starts to produce hormones in the same way the athletes are producing those hormones. And when I think about transcendence, and I think of stories of times that I have felt this feeling uh, of, of being there with someone in a game, I think of this woman. So does anyone know who this is? Hopefully we have some Serena fans in the room. I love Serena. She recently retired. Um, and Serena is, is amazing. And growing up for me, my, my parents, my dad actually was very into tennis. I remember a few days when my whole family would come together and we would watch a big game, maybe at Wimbledon. And I remember Serena just being so amazing in the sport. And 
Actually, what I remember the specific one mor morning when I was sitting in front of the screen and she was about to win this Wimbledon game and I was just like, my breath, I was holding my breath and I thought I was basically Serena because I was like, I look exactly like her. <laughs> and, you know, I just need one opportunity to get to Wimbledon and I'm going to win. <laughs> and so I, I love Serena. And, and actually, after this game, she won that game at Wimbledon. And I remember after watching that, being so inspired and so motivated that I decided to tell my parents I'm, I'm joining the tennis team and I am going to be the next Serena Williams. And so after that, I started, I went to school, I joined the tennis team, and I started practicing almost every single day. And I, I got really good. I ended up being the captain of the tennis team. And unfortunately, I didn't wait, make it to, to Wimbledon thanks to my parents. I think they just didn't invest as much into my talent. Um, and so that was their issue, not mine. But <laughs> this, this idea of transcendence, right, that we can be inspired to the extent where we can actually, it can start to impact our lives and we can actually start to uh, become like the people that are inspiring us. So in software, how do we get inspiration and how do we find people who inspire us? Um, sorry, the letters are really small on the screen, but some ways that I like to find people who inspire me are, are on the screen here. So for example, one thing that I enjoy is listening to podcasts. So there are so many creators in the Python space and I love some of the Python podcasts I listen to often. First, called Python to me, that's an amazing podcast, really good. Real Python podcast is also amazing. They have um, uh, really great uh, creators and also people who are teaching Python very well uh, on the podcast. And Python Bytes as well. They have uh, small bytes of information about things that are happening in the Python space. Really great podcast. And then conferences as well is something that I enjoy doing and meeting people at conferences. At this conference, there are amazing people here. Like. I just, uh, you know, the creator of Polars was just up here two seconds ago, so that's super cool. Um, so coming to uh, conferences to get inspired by people, and I wouldn't, I would recommend not just coming to, you know, if you're from Lithuania, it's amazing to come to PyCon Lithuania, but also going out of your comfort zone and going to conferences like PyCon US, which is one of the biggest uh, PyCon conferences in the world. And, Guido was there this year and actually gave a talk about his journey creating Python in the community. So always, uh, you know, taking some time to, to get out of your comfort zone. Even Python Ghana is coming up in a few months. I think it's in October and the CFP is out if you want to give a talk. So those are awesome opportunities to meet other uh, Pythonistas as well and get inspired. And finally, as well, uh, Twitter is another place that I love to get inspired by people. Espino is a great uh, Twitter handle to follow if you're looking for good machine learning content. Tiangolo, the creator of uh, Fast API, is fantastic to follow. And then also, one of my friends, Mr. Anami Dolbe, is great to follow as well. Uh, so those are all uh, some things I would recommend. And then I also want to talk about, so, so now that we feel motivated to be creative and we feel inspired, let's also talk a bit more in detail about practical techniques uh, we can use to bring out our creativity. So like I mentioned earlier, the study that uh, I, I talked about that was sort of exploring the role of creativity in, in software engineering groups the tools and techniques for creativity in software engineering into two categories. The first one is analogies. Uh, so really just taking mapping solutions from one domain into another. The second is feedback and getting either internal feedback from yourself or external uh, feedback from other people as well. So let's take a look at an example of some analogies. This man on the screen is actually who I mentioned earlier. His name is Pat Hanrahan. And Pat is such an interesting guy. He is the person I mentioned came and spoke at NVIDIA. He is the founder of Tableau Software, and he sold that to Salesforce for nearly $16 billion, which is insane. Um, he also won three Academy Awards <laughs> for his, so I don't know any software, many software engineers that have done that. And he did that for his work with rendering technology for, for Pixar Studios. And then he is also a professor at Stanford University. 
So when uh, Pat came and he spoke to us at, at NVIDIA, he gave a talk about innovation and creativity. And he talked about how these two things were really important for, they played an important role in his career. And in the talk, he shared that some years ago when he was first working at Pixar, and he was trying to create this rendering software, and he was trying to figure out how to represent the light reflecting on skin. And at the time, he had a lot of friends that were into art, so very artsy people that he used to hang out with. And out of curiosity, he started to, of course, as his friends would go to galleries, he started to go as well and started getting really interested in the art space. And his own curiosity for art led him to study an artist called Rembrandt. And when he was studying Rembrandt and the painters of that era, he discovered that they used a technique in oil painting called impas impasto. How do you say that? I think it's impasto. Mm -hmm. And during that time, he it was studying that technique that gave him a deeper understanding of how light interacts with translucent surfaces. And to quote him directly, actually, from that talk, he said, the artists, they sort of instinctively figured it out. They don't really know anything about physics or light transport. And inspired by this whole idea of Rembrandt, I came up with a mathematical model. And from this model, actually, he then went on to create the rendering technique that he used in Pixar films. And it's actually used in Pixar films like Toy Story and Finding Nemo. And so that was part of the story of how he used a creative technique where you're mapping you know, your knowledge from one field, the field of art, and then mapping that into a technical field and, and using mathematics for that. So the final thing that I'll talk to you today about is that technical knowledge. So obviously, Pat, it's great if he had artist friends, and, and that's fantastic, but if he didn't know how to actually take those ideas and map them into mathematics or map those into his code, that wouldn't be very useful. So for us, we also need to make sure that we have a high level of technical knowledge and that it's as broad as possible. So um, today, I do want to encourage you, there's several ways I think you can grow your technical knowledge and, and try to get experience in as many fields as possible. One way to do that is open source. So several people have talked about open source. I love open source software. If you use Python, you are using open source. Python is an open source programming language. And if you go on GitHub today and you look for Python, you can find the entire Python code base on GitHub. And so if you want to figure out how to create your own Python language and, I don't know, deploy it somewhere, or I don't know what you would use it for, um, you can go on to GitHub and you can learn how to do that. Or if you're frustrated with something in Python and want to change it, you can actually create a pull request and, and, uh, and have that be changed. So more recently for me, in my own personal context, I love open source for experimenting with things. Recently I've been very interested in machine learning and AI, and something that I do with open source is I'll go onto GitHub and I'll look for a project that seems interesting, something that I feel like, oh, I want to know how to do that, or I want to learn how to copy that. <laughs> I will go and then I will clone the repo, and I will try and experiment and do it uh, on, my, on my own laptop. So this is one of the projects that I did. I cloned a repo from the Hugging Face repository, and I was able to do this locally on my own machine. I made some changes to it, but basically it takes a video of myself and changes it into a cartoon, and I think it, it turned out super cool. Um, and I try to also open source the projects that I am working on or that I share, and so if you want to also see the things that I have worked on so far, you can uh, find me on GitHub, I'm MarlenZW there. And for anyone that's interested in learning about open source or getting started in the open source space, uh, I think it's, it's sometimes quite intimidating to get started, even contributing. I would definitely recommend that if you want to grow comfortable with the idea of making new uh, projects or uh, being creative with different sorts of, of Python code, then contributing to the code on GitHub is a great idea or a great way to do that. And I have actually written a guide to be able to do that on my website. I wrote a guide uh, sharing how I made my first PR to Apache Arrow. And if you'd like to do a step-by-step -step guide, <clears throat> I tried to make it as beginner-friendly as possible. So you can find that on my website. And if you are here at the conference on Saturday, there are going to be sprints. 
and people are going to be learning how to contribute to open source. So if you are here on Saturday, I definitely recommend that you come and join us for, for the sprints where we'll be learning how to, to contribute to open source. So that is pretty much it for my talk. If you would like to get in contact with me, feel free to reach out to my email is marlene at ultrondata.com. You can find me on Twitter, I tweet a lot. And uh, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. So that is all for my talk, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Wendy. If someone has any questions. Yes, does anyone have questions? There's one. <laughs> so uh, I think, well, sorry, first of all, sorry, it's not actually a question, but um, for example, he mentioned I've never contributed to open source. Do you think going to something like a sprint is a good idea to learn how to contribute to open source? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think a sprint is the best place to go for that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, so Mark and I is going to run a workshop tomorrow about contributing to open source. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, if there's a workshop specifically for that, I mean, that's great, too. <laughs>